Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. <laughs> I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is the daily show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome, one and all, to the greatest movie news show in the galaxy. My name is Mark, and we do apologize for our tardiness today. We had a few minor technical difficulties, but rest assured, I am now fully clothed and ready to talk <laughs> movies. Ashley, who's rocking with us today? Also, here is John Schnapp. Pacific Rim job. Whoa. What? Whoa. Whoa. Uh, hey, what's going on, everybody? Also, here is Christian Harloff. Fully clothed, pants yes. off. Right. Hey, they can't tell the difference. It's news to them. Uh, before we get rolling today, we wanted to remind you guys that this Sunday is Hollywood Super Bowl. The Oscars and us here at Collider are actually going to be here in studio doing a very special live pre-show that's going to kick off at 4 p.m. PST. That's 7 o'clock for you East Coasters. We're going to be watching the ceremony here. We're going to be doing a lot of fun Instagram vids, stuff like that. And then afterwards, we're going to do a post show. We don't know what time that's going to start because we don't know how long they're going to go on for. You know, fun fact, even one of us here is actually going to be on the red carpet for the Oscars. Who yeah. is it? Not this guy, but somebody else <laughs> that you know and love. Nova. With all that out of the way, Ashley, what's our first topic? Well, breaking news last night, Deadline is reporting that Legendary Pictures has hired Stephen S. DeKnight to direct Pacific Rim 2, the follow-up to Guillermo del Toro's 2013 film. This will be DeKnight's feature directorial debut, who is most notably known as the executive producer and head writer of Marvel's Daredevil for Netflix, as well as the creator of Spartacus for Stars. No word on a release as of yet, or in what capacity Guillermo del Toro is to the project, as he was not mentioned as being involved in the report. The current script is written by Prometheus and Doctor Strange writer John Spates. Mark, thoughts on Stephen DeKnight taking over directing duties on Pacific Rim 2? Well, my first thought is this is awesome, because now we get a guy who I really believe in his talent. He's a, he's a young dude. He gets a shot at a big-time Hollywood movie. He was great taking care of Daredevil for what he participated in that. And he was one of the guys involved in the writer's room for these new Transformers. Transformers films that really kind of got the shaft once Michael Bay came back to the forefront. So if you give me Steven tonight and he's doing Pacific Rim 2, I think it's the right play for the studio and for that movie franchise because, look, I love Guillermo del Toro. He's got a great creative vision. I think that when you watch the first Pacific Rim, it's great fun. It's awesome to watch, but the story was a little lacking. And even though they have the same person coming back doing this story, at least it appears from this report, Steven tonight being involved in that writer's room, in the creative process, I think is a huge Boone for Pacific Rim 2. This is really, really exciting news. Christian, this morning at the pre-show meeting, we were talking about how maybe he had some really good ideas right. for Transformers that he can just throw in a Pacific Rim 2, right? Yeah, and I think that that's exactly right. The fact that this dude, I, I know a lot of people don't really know who he is, so right away when you say Stephen Knight and people are going, oh, I want a Del Toro back. Guys, this is a good thing for sure because the Knight is a very creative dude. What he did with Spartacus, what he did with, with Daredevil, and I'm, I bet you one of the things that he did in that writer's room was come up with some really good ideas and the stuff that whether Michael Bay or whoever else said, no, we're not going to use those. Hey, can, I have, can I have them? And now he's going to use those in Pacific Rim. I think that this will be a way for him to showcase to everyone who doesn't know who he is just exactly what he's capable of. I think this is a fantastic thing for this franchise to get this dude who's going to put a lot of time, a lot of effort into it. And I think we have a, a real kind of superstar director on our hands. I just love that idea where it's like, I got all these great robot ideas, and now I can finally put them in a movie. Are you pumped for this, Chanel? I am super pumped. I mean, I know Dennis and I love Pacific Rim, the, the first one. Saw it a couple times in the theater. It's a great action, like old school monster film. Like if you were a little kid and you like Godzilla and now you're an adult, you're going to love this film because it had that love of giant monsters fighting giant robots. I mean, that's yeah. I waited my entire life to see something of a large budget spectacle like this. And, you know, it didn't do too well in America. It did great in China, which is the whole reason it got that whole second, you know, possible second uh, film. Didn't go over too well. And then with uh, Guillermo's uh, Crimson Peak not doing too well, I think, you know, he keeps escalating his uh, story so that, like, every time he does a sequel, they're like 300 million, 400 million. You're like, dude, can you 
come on back a little bit, man. Like I, I love Guillermo's direction. I love the, I love his ideas. I love his creature designs. I just, you know, I think if he could like rein it in a little bit and get that budget back to like a fifty to seventy five million, it makes it more. Oh, it makes it better for his genre because it's like some of the, sometimes his movies are not going to open as big as what you might expect or what you might want. Anyway, I think tonight is a great pick for this. I mean, he's already he did a great job taking over for Drew Goddard on Daredevil, so it shows that like he can fit himself into any genre. The guy's a giant nerd. Look at all his weird, crazy tattoos. I mean, he's like I, I think I cannot wait to see what he does with this. And well, let me ask you guys too, because this report didn't mention whether Del Toro is going to be involved or not. As a matter of fact, his name wasn't in the report anywhere. So, do you think that he will be involved, and do you think he should be involved in any capacity? Well, yes, he should be involved because it was his property. I mean, yeah. it was the fact that he came up with. The, the initial idea and he's working on it now whether or not they like and Schnepp and I were talking about this before whether or not they scrapped the entire script right. and but I think that what they are going to do they have to it's his property so he's yeah. going to get producer credit on it or something they're just not mentioning him in this because they're putting the focus on tonight right. now the other reason why you got to rein it back in for Del Toro of the 70 80 million is because it makes studios breathe a little easier when they see a property like like this, which the first one did okay, right. and it, he throws in a second one. Oh, it's going to cost about two hundred fifty million dollars to make. They're like, well, I, right. there's no reason to do this. So, and I saw one of the comments in the chat board. So, like, oh, I hope they don't Josh Trank this guy too. I don't think that's going to happen yeah. with this property because Fantastic Four and Marvel and 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 the Fox regime over there. It's a little. They've had a track record of, of doing right. that. I think that you don't bring in a Stephen tonight, to, especially because it's Paramount, right? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, because Paramount they they already have established a relationship with it's him legendary. now that. Yeah, and, and yeah. they established a relationship with him in the writer's room of Transformers, so that, that's obviously where this whole thing started from, right. where he probably had a bunch of meetings, said, look, I'd like to do this with it. Maybe we can kind of turn this particular idea into Pacific Rim. So I think they trust in him, so I don't and worry about a trank. Tonight's been around the block, man. The guy's like, yeah. he did four seasons of Spartacus. He did, like, all of Daredevil. He's, he's been in tons of different writer's room. He knows how to be a team player. I mean, he's a great pick to do this, and I think it. I think they are going to probably re rework the script, change it, budget it down a little bit, make it make sense for what it is. And I'm sure Guillermo is going to be credited as executive producer. I'm sure story by. Right. I'm pretty sure they're still doing an animated series. That's the last night I heard about it. So it's Guillermo's property. They're just like giving the reins to someone else. Let's get the Kaiju versus the Jaeger. Let's get King Kong versus Godzilla. Then yeah. throw them all into one big giant. Sure, piece no of alpha. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, what do we got next? After months of speculation. Speculation. Looks like we finally know what Selma director Ava DuVernay will take on as her next directing project. According to a report from Deadline, DuVernay will direct an adaptation of the Madeline Langle novel A Wrinkle in Time for Disney. Though she entered preliminary talks to helm Marvel's Black Panther, she decided the movie wasn't right for her and she and Marvel amicably parted ways. A Wrinkle in Time revolves around a young girl whose government scientist father goes missing after working on a mysterious project. The search for her father Father takes her to alternate dimensions where she crosses paths with a variety of different creatures. Christian, what do you think about DuVernay taking on this classic adaptation? I love this choice. I think it's really cool to see she's, you know, she's going to, the fact that she's got a strong kind of female character to work with as, as lead, but to also play into science fiction. And, and I, like this to me is a great fit for her. And I want to see what she does because she's such a talented director. And to see now her moving on to other, this is to me always what, great directors do they jump from different genres to challenge themselves and it's not just the same platform over and over and over again it's it's more and more let me try sci-fi let me try she, she was looking into comic book movies she's looking into all these different movies so this is a movie wrinkling time i would love to see her vision of it so i, I love this i'm show. about to drop a bomb i actually read a wrinkle in time taco when I was a bell kid. bam yeah. <laughs> bomb dropped <laughs> thank you everybody the taco bell joke a little early yes. for that. i think ava duvernay is a great choice to direct a wrinkle in time whether <laughs> she's dining at Taco Bell or not. It's important because she's a great storyteller. That's what you need when you're directing a movie like this. It doesn't matter how big the budget is, what the scale of the story is, if you're telling a true story based on biographical facts, or you're just doing a story that is clearly science fiction in the realm of fantasy. I love Christian. I, I agree with you. She's a little girl. She's looking for her father. This journey is going to be, it, it's the right person. And if I had the choice, if you gave me Black Panther and you gave me A Wrinkle in Time and I have to pick who's directing what, I probably put Duvernay on that and yeah. put Coogler on Black Panther. I think that everybody ends up winning in these scenarios. Yeah, uh, just like a few weeks ago, uh, Holly and I were talking about different sci-fi uh, books, 
and she mentioned a wrinkle, a wrinkle in time, and was like, "That's something that should be adapted." And then literally, this this news dropped a, like a week or so later. She's so I don't know. If she's really excited. So about both it. I, members of the Schnepp clan are actually oracles. You <laughs> yeah. do the box office. She does the novels. She does the books and stuff. But anyway, I'm very excited to, to see her ad adaptation too. I think she's an incredibly t talented director, and I cannot wait to see that. Am I the only one here that's read a wrinkle you in are. time? I did yeah. not read it. Ashley, did you read a wrinkle in time? Not what no. Weird universe. Definitely. Are we in? What school did you go to? I don't Ellis know first. why I read yeah. it. I think I was. Probably like again, like yesterday. I think I read it for the free Pizza Hut, yeah. but oh, I got okay. through it. So nice. there Dropping we go. Bombs. What do we got next? Producer Roy Lee, in an interview with Steve Frosty Weintraub of Collider.com, spoke a bit about the status of the Lego Batman movie and the Ninjago movie based on the Cartoon Network show. In regards to Lego Batman, the movie is currently being animated right now, as it's the next movie to come out in the series. Lego Batman will also share a similar tone as the previous Lego movie, and will ask the question, can Batman ever be happy? <laughs> as for the Ninjago movie, Lee said, anyone who knows the series on Cartoon Network will be blown away by the look and feel and huge scope of how we've expanded the universe of Ninjago. It's like seeing the Lego movie in a ninja universe. Schnepp, are you excited for the Lego Batman and Ninjago movies? I don't know about the word excited, but I mean, you know what? It's like, I didn't think anything about the Lego movie and I saw that and I was like, wow, what a fun, crazy, weird film, you know? Everything's awesome, weird songs and stuff. And uh, my friend Chris McKay is directing the Batman Lego film. Okay. So I'm really happy for Chris. Awesome job. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I think, you know, if Batman's going to bust out and start singing a song, you know, about like, oh, when can I be happy, right. Alfred? You know, you, you know, there's going to be songs. A Joker will bust out and sing a song. But it's Lego. So now that I, it's a proven track record now, like I saw the first film. If they're going and like, I don't get really care about the ninja whatever the hell it's called but ninjago ninjago it's like i don't know what that is with a rhino ninja whatever it is it's like that's i'm sure it'll be fun but i'm gonna see the batman lego movie and i'm expecting that same quality level that we saw from the first lego film only all batman so it's a no lose situation well it's not just a rhino ninja john yeah. there's a lot of if you ever seen more? ninjago on cartoon not, network it not. is crazy what is mayhem it? what is it, it is so much it's a bunch of ninjas fighting and in the lego universe the way that these quotes read is that they're going to take that to the next level. I don't know how you do that on a bigger scale than it already is, but that's exciting. But I agree with you. Look, Lego Batman is the one that I'm really pumped for. There's two Lego movies coming out next year. You're going to have Batman in February, and then you're going to have Ninjago, I believe, in September. So maybe it's going to get to the point where it's a little bit Lego overkill because Batman is such a well-known property. I think that's going to be fine. But Ninjago is not as well-known. A guy who loves cartoons over here hasn't checked it out yet. It is, so I'm not yeah. sure how that movie is going to be, be done. I'm not sure if it's going to have as wide of an audience as Lego Batman. But the real question with Lego Batman, do they go into his origin story? Do we yeah, see, they have do we to. see Lego parents die? Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> how far back are we taking this dark, brooding right. superhero? Or are we just going to keep it light and fluffy? I really want to know that. I'm excited for both of them. And I'll tell you why. Because of the Lego movie. And I remember when they announced the Lego movie, and I was, and I had seen something from the Star Wars that they'd done. So I was a little bit more excited than I think other people were. And then it delivered. And because of that, I think by putting Batman out in February, that's the move. Because mm -hmm. if Batman hits, and it hit, and it seems like it will, and it seems like they have a really, if they have the script and, and kind of the same tone that the Lego movie did, then you're going to get a little bit more excited for Ninjago. It's like, wait a minute, they just knocked two out of the park. Because we're excited for the Batman one, obviously because it's Batman, but because Lego movie was so good. If both the movies are great. And then, oh, yeah, I'd love to see another one. Then you're going to be like, okay, let me catch up more. You'll want to right. learn a little bit more about Ninjago. And then maybe they give him a cameo in, in this one or whatever it might be. But I think to have two of them, I don't want to have two every year. Right. But for two, I, I think it could be fun. And that spoofy kind of tone that they have with the Lego movie is so going to be well served by the Batman source material. Because yeah. Evie, we got to talk to your boy Chris about this. Because yeah. there's apparently going to be multiple Batman in the Batman Lego movie. So you get different iterations of Batman. Maybe you get more of an Adam Westy one. You get a Michael Keaton, a Christian oh, Bale. that's too good. Maybe you get the Dark Knight as we're about to see him in Batman versus Superman. I know that the story, I think they're already animating it as we speak. So it's going to be interesting to see all these different Batman in one movie, kind of making fun of the character. You know, when we get closer, we'll have him on the show once it gets closer yeah, to cool. the time of the release. I have a question, though. What do you guys think, like, with, with these Lego movies now coming out? Remember a couple, like, a year after... Lego movie exploded. Mm -hmm. We had like Pez. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. had like emojis. We had the Spork the movie. Angry I mean, what Birds. Else? Angry Birds.
Wars is coming out. So what do you think? What lies next as far as like, what do you think is going to be the next leg? We got bottle caps too. We got Bo- bottle caps. bobbleheads, the movie. <laughs> Look, but Bo- you know what? We laugh and everybody crapped on the emoji movie when it first right, got yeah. announced. Everybody said the same thing about Angry Birds. That trailer is pretty damn sure. I love the trailer. Good so far. I, know, yeah. I didn't think I'd like that trailer. I actually really like we'll it. Let's see. save judgment for the movie. Hey, That's right. We'll we're save not buying judgment. or selling just yet. Save judgment. But we're about to right now because it is time for that segment of the show that we call Buy or Sell. What's going to happen is Ashley is going to present the gentleman with a topic and we'll simply say whether we buy it or sell it then we'll defend our choice with a few sentences all right i guess we have deadpool to thank for this one a post from filmratings.com revealed that warner home video will release an alternate cut of their much hyped batman and superman movie in an r-rated blu-ray release entitled batman vs superman dawn of justice ultimate edition the post goes on to say that the rating was determined for sequences of violence this follows a similar move by director Zack snyder who famously released an alternate cut of his watchman movie on home video no word on a release date as of yet Mark Byers sell an R-rated alternate cut of Batman vs. Superman. Ash, I'm going to have to sell it on multiple fronts. One, because I'm not entirely sure that any of this is accurate. We want to say that, look, it, it, we don't know. This is this has not been confirmed by too many sources. It all seems to be coming from filmratings.com. So I don't know what to believe as far as the report, if there actually is already a cut. I didn't even know that they rated Blu-rays. I thought that the movie came out, it was whatever is rated in theater, and then sometimes you get the unrated version, right. which you would just going in to assume that it's going to be rated R. As a kid, you see unrated, and you're like, ah, oh, there's probably more blood and more boobs than I got to see in the theater. Maybe I'll check that out. Now, look, the prospect of an R-rated Batman versus Superman is something that is very titillating to me. Whoa. But, I, A, I don't know whether to believe it, and also I don't know that this is the right time to announce that you're going to have a Blu-rated version that's different than the one in the theater. Schnapp, I know that you want to see Batman v Superman. Right. Does knowing or possibly knowing that there's going to be an R-rated Blu-ray version, does that enhance your appeal, or does it kind of reduce how excited you are for the theatrical version? I have to say it reduces it, and when that news popped off last night, I kind of questioned it right off the bat. I'm like, this is a weird marketing move for Warner Brothers to release an the, first of all, that Batman versus Superman or V Superman would be R-rated in the first place ever. It's they sell these to, they sell toys to kids, and the whole idea of pr- t- putting out a Blu-ray or uh, an Ultimate Edition that's three three and a half hours, like an extended cut. Granted, it is for the the older uh, the older sweaty nerds. The people are like, I'm gonna get the Blu-ray that's got the. It's not for the seven year old. I mean, we know? buy toys too. Yeah, I'm just saying. But you fair. know what I'm saying though. It's like, I think. It's a little too early for them to release that news, so I don't know if it's a hundred. I don't really believe it's true. I I, I question the validity of whatever filmrated.com is uh, until it actually comes out a statement from Warner Brothers saying we are releasing a special edition, blue rated ultimate edition. Then I'll believe it, but I think it doesn't really make that much sense, especially with the marketing campaign. We're literally like four weeks away from re- the release of the film, so we got two cells. Christian, are you making it three? No, I'm going to buy it because uh, for for the reason that it's actually it was the. MPAA that, that put out the report, so I'm going to buy that it's that it's accurate. What I think happened is that the Warner Brothers executives saw all the, all the hype around the Deadpool stuff too. They right. they saw the first cut of Snyder's movie, and Snyder has been known for whether it be the the cut of Watchmen, which is obviously rated R. He's, right. he's worked in, he's worked in 300. He's worked in the R before, so he probably had a, the first version of Batman v Superman that was pretty violent. You're not going to see any nudity or anything like that. The way Deadpool and the language is probably the bad. It's probably really violent in a way that the MPAA said okay. With the, maybe there's some blood or whatever. They, so they, they submitted it, and, and they submitted it because of all the Deadpool hype. And because it is early for, for a Blu-ray release at this point. Right. So they, <laughs> The movie's not out yet. I know. It's, it's I, but, I, but that's what I'm saying, because they knew that this story, they, they knew the MPA would release it. They knew we'd, people would start talking about it. So they wanted to get the hype more because for, for the amount of money that the Deadpool audience did. And, and like you said, the older sweaties right. want to go and see it. Now, I, what I think will happen is I think that, they, that whether they release that thing for everybody to see, It'll be a cool thing. I don't think it'll hurt the box office though at all because it's still Batman v Superman. So the question is if they're going to put that, where they're going to, how they're going to sell that and keep that R-rated version out of the hands of kids. That's another topic altogether. Right. But as far as hurting box office, no. I think it's a good move if they actually do it. Now whether or not they actually release it is another thing. Do you think it's a dangerous precedent to set though, where we're already going to announce that we have a different cut that maybe some fans want more of a movie? Yeah. Like if they do this with Wolverine, say right. Let's say Wolverine, the Wolverine. 
comes out, Wolverine 3 is being released in a couple months, and it's rated PG-13. And then they come out and they say, oh, don't worry, we got an R-rated version coming on Blu-ray. I just think it kind of dampens everybody's excitement for the movie I agree bit. with you 100%. I think, that's why I don't believe this report is real, because I think what it makes it by saying, oh, we've got this Ultimate Edition that's R R R rated R. This is the one that you want to see, but it's not the one that we're releasing. It makes people like, I'll just wait a month and I'll see the Blu-ray. Yeah, I don't think that'll happen, though. Yeah. I think you now because it's Batman vs Superman again, and I think that it'll actually do the opposite. If they actually did that, that R-rated version of it, whether or not they said we're definitely putting it out, you don't you don't say that right. until after the movie comes out because then I think that'll even sell even more Blu-rays. No, I'm with you. I'm seeing the movie and I'm buying the right. Ultimate Edition. So, but you know, I guess there's a lot of people like us who are going to buy both. Right. So. Well, look, I mean, it, it appears to have come from the MPAA, but if it was forged or it wasn't real, it wouldn't be the first time in the history of this movie that we've gotten some false reports. Right. Enter the Night and Dawn of Justice right. being prime examples. Ashley, let's talk about dead people. There's still life in Zombieland 2 after all. On a recent episode of the Q&A podcast, Deadpool screenwriter Rhett Reese revealed some details about the long in development sequel to the 2009 hit from Sony Pictures. He had this to say on the podcast. It's actually still in development at Sony. They've had a couple writers take a crack at it. We're still exec producers and we're guiding and helping where we can. And I think there's still very much talk about it, but I think it has to be right. I think all the actors and original zombie Zombieland, Zombieland director Ruben Fleischer all feel like there's no reason to do it again if we're not getting it exactly right. Christian Byersell Zombieland 2 making it to the big screen based on these comments. Nah, I sell it. We talked about this on uh, on Mailbag the other day, Dennis and I, and I, I just this is kind of the same comments that they've been saying. I just, yeah, there's ideas behind it that they they did that one pilot I think it was for Amazon, Amazon. Or Amazon and it, it didn't work. Um, it, it's starting to become a, a little too late, I think, to do a second one. I loved the first one. I thought it was a, a lot of fun. I don't know if we're ever going to see the second one come to the screen, though. Yeah, I, I sell it as of right now. It's a bummer because I really enjoyed the first zombie land, one of the best cameos I've ever seen. And right. in addition to that, it was a fun story, and I'd like to see more adventures in this universe. But, you know, Christian, it's funny because you and I were talking to somebody in the know as far as production of movies goes yeah. yesterday, and they made the point that sometimes whether you're talking about a horror movie like The Strangers 2 or even talking about Zombieland 2, it, it's incumbent upon studios to make sure that everybody knows they have these movies that are on the slate, that are about out to be released whether they're actually ever going to be in production or not it looks good for all your shareholders and everything else to see oh look at all these movies they have in the pipeline so unfortunately right now i i don't have enough solid ground to stand on to say yeah there's definitely going to be a zombie land too love to see it just from this report i can't buy it yet yeah i don't know i mean the excitement of seeing zombie land 2 is gone for me i mean i think i love the first film and if they just popped off another zombie land a year or two or even three years later that would have been great they did a they did a pilot for a series like two years ago. That's already like eight years after the movie came out. I don't even remember when the movie right. came out. How many years ago did Zombieland come out? Two thousand nine, I believe. Two thousand nine. So yeah, so, yeah it's six seven years ago. Seven. Yeah. Okay. I like I said, I really loved it. But there's so many other zombie projects now, zombie series that are out. I mean, there's like two different Walking Dead television shows. I don't know. I just feel like Zombieland two. Even if they announce it, and they're like, we're shooting it next week. I'd be like, all right, cool. I guess I'll see it when it comes out. I have zero excitement for me. There is a lot. We're really inundated with zombies. Yeah, like both in serious kind of yeah. stuff like Walking Dead and then also like a scout's guide to the zombie apocalypse yeah. or Shaun of the Dead yeah. stuff like that. There's just a lot of zombie art floating around there. Maybe Zombieland 2 gets made. We just can't buy it yet. Yep. Ashley, what's next? The focus for Warner Brothers and DC Films thus far in the marketing scheme for Batman vs. Superman has been on the iconic superheroes of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. That has now changed thanks to Warner Brothers releasing three new posters focusing on the supporting characters. That of Amy Adams' Lois Lane, Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor, and Jeremy Irons' Alfred. The new posters share the same style as the previous posters and represent a, diff a different look at the supporting players in the blockbuster superhero hero showdown and with the release of these posters we are now officially one month away from batman <gasps> vs superman Yay. dawn of justice hitting theaters schnett buy or sell these new posters for batman vs superman I sell them if they're R-rated. Where's the nude version? <laughs> That's what I'm waiting for. Yeah, they're great. There's some posters, some of the supporting cast, whatever. I mean, it's great to see. I I, I love Jeremy Irons as Alfred. But let's see Amy him Adams. naked. I let's, see, see, let's see Scar naked. Can we naked. just see him naked and see the R-rated version? Stop playing around with these weird rumors already. Yeah, whatever. The posters are great. Move on. I can't wait to see the movie. Wait, wait, four weeks? 
I buy these. Yeah, we got about four weeks left, yeah. gentlemen. And then, you know, a oh, lot the way, longer. I, I buy it as well. See the R-rated so, cover. So. Well, good. I'm glad you buy it. You seem very excited about it, as am I. I actually saw these in billboard form yesterday. I went to the Grove in Los Angeles to dine at Wood Ranch, as I can frequently be spotted. And I pulled in, and I see the first one I saw was Alfred. And I'm like, dude, they're marketing Alfred as a badass. Now, look, the first Alfred in the Michael Keaton versions was, a night, you know, you believed in him as kind of a father figure right. for Bruce Wayne. And then the Michael Caine guy comes in, and he's like, oh, you know what? I used to be Rambo and Burn. And we're like, what is Alfred's backstory? Now, with that most recent trailer we got, Alfred's actually going with them on missions. Mm -hmm. I loved the casting of Jeremy Irons as Alfred. He deserves his own poster. Amy Adams, certainly Lois Lane, deserves her own poster. And Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. These are all characters that we want to see in this film because they're part of the Batman and Superman world. So it makes sense to have these posters as opposed to just throwing other members of the Justice League in there because they're probably just going to have a, cam a cameo. Christian, are you going to make it three buys? <laughs> no. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, only, I'm only gonna I'm only gonna sell them as individual posters, but as as far as marketing for the whole entire thing, like if it was like one big group, if you see Batman, Superman, then the three of them together, as far as like one poster alone sitting in a theater of just Amy Adams with her hand on her hips with the Daily Planet all by itself, I don't know if that's the way you sell Batman be Superman. As far as those three together in like a book or something, I'm looking at all the pictures that are, that are selling this movie as the characters. Yes, like when I see Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman in these types of pictures, I'm buying them. But as far as single posters all by themselves, all you're really doing is slapping a logo on there. And oh, there's Jesse Eisenberg in a wig with the X. And it's just, it's so right now, uh, the single no all together, yes. That's it, man. We got to go to Wood Ranch because when you pull in the growth, it's the billboard it's all and it's got of all of them. Yeah, yeah. Right. See, see, I'll do that. Sweet. Yeah, I'll do that. Well, they're doing a little similar. Like, remember, uh, I think it was Batman Forever where they had the singles for all the characters. But they had them all together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it works like that. I mean, I agree with what yeah. you're saying, but it's also it's kind of a little bit of a breath of fresh air instead of seeing there's Batman coming at Superman and here's the reverse of Superman sure. coming at Batman. Here's like, oh, there are other characters in the film besides the three main. Yeah, characters. And I love so seeing. I those, like it. Yeah, I love seeing those characters. It's just it's, I'm just talking about in a pure marketing. I agree 100. Like if you if just saw Alfred somewhere. Yeah, you'd be like, if, what's if, that? If yeah. Amy Adams is just standing there with her hands on her hips, that's the only thing you see. Yeah. You're not gonna stop and go, oh, Batman versus Superman's right. coming out. But if the three of them are together like that. Totally. And and you see those three posters like oh wait that it's all part of one big marketing so, and then batman for superman is down the hallway then i get it all right well we're going to eat barbecue and you're buying uh <laughs> now it is the time in the show where we go to amc's rewind segment it is brought to you by our friends at amc theaters get all your showtime and ticket information for current movies at amctheaters.com this is what john campy fictionally uh, titled fictionally titled the getting old or feeling old segment because these are the movies that came out 10 and 20 years ago this week. First up, 10 years ago, we had Tyler Perry's Medea's Family Reunion, Running Scared, starring Paul Walker and Little Fish with Kate Blanchett. And celebrating their big 20th this week is Before and After with Meryl Streep and Liam Neeson, Mary Riley with Julia Roberts, Jackie Chan in Rumble in the Bronx, and Ray Liotta in Unforgettable. Christian, <laughs> I'm throwing it to you first because I want to hear you <laughs> to describe to everybody out there the plot of Ray Liotta's Unforgettable. Unforgettable yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> do it Be like you did. It. Do it Be exactly like you did. Like I was, yeah. I'm like, what the hell was that? Because this was right around the time when when Ray Liotta was, you know, coming off a of Goodfellas a little a little later on. And you're like, wait a minute, what's this movie? And then you read the synopsis. It is pretty much <laughs> beat by beat the fugitive. I mean, it, it is. It's like a guy who's a, a doctor who's accused of murdering his wife gets gets off and then finds out that another doctor is behind. Then it is out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, by the way, he's able to take some of her spinal fluid and see into her past. Whoa, well, that yeah. sounds like a fugitive. <laughs> right? Right? Well, up in the ante. So I'm going to go ahead and. Not talking about that ever again. But uh, <laughs> but Rumble in the Bronx is the one that stands out to me. I mean, I was always a big Julia Roberts fan, and, and I remember seeing Mary Riley on it. That was not good. Mary Riley. Yeah, just, remember that yeah, commercial? Mary yeah, Riley. really creepy. Yeah. Um, so I don't remember before and after. So Rumble in the Bronx, it, it, it was Jackie Chan in his prime. So Yeah, Rumble in the Bronx came out, and it was like the re-announcement of Jackie Chan to American audiences. Yeah. And then after that, he got a couple other movies that did okay, because it's like, oh, my God, we forgot that this guy existed in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's great to see him on a scale like that. Mary Riley, funnily enough, is the one that stands out to me because when I was a kid in school, everybody was talking about how we didn't know there was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde movie coming out because it was just so marketed very strangely. I get that she, her character was the centerpiece, but you'd think you'd want to throw the fact that this is a Jekyll and right. Hyde kind of tale more so than just some made in the 1800s. So right. it, it, the marketing for that movie didn't really make sense to me. Schnepp, 
What is unforgettable about this week to you? <laughs> uh, not unforgettable. I, that I never saw that movie. It's non-rememberable. I can't remember it. Um, I don't even remember it came out. The only thing that I, that I, strikes me is that Linda Fiorentino's in it. And she oh, was a, right. What right. an amazing right. actress. Right. And she just dropped off the face of the planet. I think this might have been her last film that she was involved in. Uh -huh. But uh, Rumble in the Bronx sticks out to me. I love Jackie Chan. I was lucky enough that when I was in college, uh, the lady who ran our film center, Bar Barbara Sherrod was her name. Um, she was bringing in like John, uh, John Wu, uh, not J uh, John Wu. Uh, no, no, no. Hmm. I'm sorry. I'd hang it out was, with that dude. She brought Jackie Chan in and uh, Chow Yun Fat. Sorry, I was trying to remember oh, his right. name. Chow Yun Fat. She she brought them in and like had their films screening for us. And this was the early early uh, 90s or late 80s. It was like incredible like to see these films. And then a few years later, we saw Rumble in the Bronx. And that was the very first like kind of Americanized version of the Jackie Chan film, you know? Right. So, I mean, for myself, it's like definitely check out Drunken Master 2, mm -hmm. see a lot of his other films. But Rumble in the Bronx is really good like first step into the world of Jackie Chan. I mean, look, if you go back 20 years and you say it's February in 1996, I think Unforgettable was the first time we looked at Ray Liotta and was like, this guy might be doing tequila commercials. <laughs> oh, years. so now. Well, you know, it's, it's funny about too, when you look at the 10 and 20 years ago too, when, at what point did it start to switch? Because it, we haven't had a really great movie that's popped out in these rewinds in, right. in a while. At what point did it start from like January until about March was the dumping ground. Now it's just about January. Right. At what point did it, we start getting better movies in February? I'll March? tell you when. Taken, baby. First Taken movie came well, out. Well, no, but God, 300 came out like, in March, too. 300 came out in March. Yeah, but March yeah. was already like better than January and February. Taken, right. that's the one you want to take your parents to. Um, now we're on to Mailbag, everybody. Here's how Mailbag works. Is that if you guys wrote in questions, Ashley's going to read a couple of them on air right now. How do you submit a question? You just email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. And after Mailbag, we are going to get to some of your live Twitter questions. So if you're one of the many millions watching us live right now, tweet at Ashley and see if she can get your question on the air. Just tweet us at Collider Video. Ashley, what's in the bag? Sam Dean writes, hello, Collider crew. You guys are my daily addiction. Every year, there's always that one surprise movie that people weren't expecting and then comes out of nowhere. Which film for 2016 do you think that the general movie going public are not aware of right now that could do this? I personally feel it will be the movie Passengers, directed by Morton Tildum and starring Chris Pratt, Jennifer Lawrence. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Well, Sam Dean, I totally agree with you. I think people are going to start talking about Passengers once a trailer for that hits. It comes out in December. I think that's going to be a movie that really is going to be one to look out for. I'm going to say one movie now, and then I'm going to get your boys' take. Then I'm going to close with another movie. The one that, uh, look, I'm going out on a ledge here, okay? But I'm just going on cast and the fact that it could be a fun, silly action movie called Criminal. Okay, so you got Kevin Costner, oh, yeah. you got Tommy Lee Jones, you got Ryan Reynolds, you got Gary Oldman. Three of those four gents were all in JFK together, along with three thousand other people. It looks like a movie that's got a weird science fiction. kind of think some guy dies and they put his DNA in somebody else, but it's nothing like Ray Liotta and his dead wife. So it's something that I think you could get on board with. It comes out, I believe, in March or April, so it might be that like pre-summer dumping ground we were talking about. But it might be a fun time at the box office. Um, I'm gonna go with I th even though it comes out this week. I think Eddie. The the Eagle, mm. I think, is one that people are going to be talking about a lot. I think people are sleeping on that one. Um, the Accountant with uh, Ben Affleck. I think Gavin O'Connor uh, directs yeah. that one as well, too. Nobody's really talking about that one yet. I think they will be. Uh, Demolition with Jake Gyllenhaal. Sully, which and it's, these are all movies that people will be talking about right. soon. It's just it's it's early, but you know, uh, with Tom Hanks and Midnight Special. Clint Eastwood directing Sully. How do you feel about that? I can Excited? do that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. working with Tom Hanks. I mean, sure. I, li I like that you mentioned Midnight Special. That's one that's like floating under the radar right now. And once it comes out, I think it's going to become a sleeper. Uh, I'll say High Rise, which is uh, the Tom Hiddleston film being directed by Ben Wheatley. It's it, Check out that trailer. It's online. It looks crazy and exciting and surrealistic and scary. And it's like a thriller. Ben Wheatley's done a lot of great, like kind of psychological horror films. That's the one I'm picking, like that's gonna take people by surprise. Okay, well look, all your guys' movies are great, but they're fighting for second place because this summer we get Blake Lively in the ocean, trapped on a buoy, surrounded by a great white shark in the shallows. Holy crap, how awesome does that movie sound? Blake Lively versus a great white shark terrorizing her. This could be the next Jaws, right? <laughs> 
John Hilko would agree with me if it was an octopus and not a great white hey, shark. Hey, I like Blake we'll Lively, get that. so I'm still going to see the movie. Dude, it's a shark, man. I'm totally I'm going to see it, too, because I have to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's go to some live Twitter questions and see what we got. Ashley, what are the kids tweeting about? Christopher Woodburn writes, what film have you guys seen in the theaters the most? For me, it's The Dark Knight Rises 12 times. Wow. 12 times wow. The Dark Knight Rises, really? Did it get better? It was 12 times. I know, right? It's like, oh, man. Uh, let's see. I got five Force Awakens to my credit. I once saw Die Hard with a Vengeance three times in the same day. Wow. That's How pretty cool. Times? Three times in the same day. That's my aunt took impressive. me that morning, took my friends that oh. afternoon, went with my parents that night. It was great every single That's time. Pretty awesome. Most all time theater for me, I think I got to go with Jurassic Park. I think Jurassic Park is a movie. Came out in the summertime. I was a kid. We just kept going back to the movie theater to see that one. I probably logged seven or eight trips to the theater to see them cute dinosaurs. What do you got? <sighs> Phantom Menace, six times. In the theater, I saw that when it, when it came out. Um, no judgment. No, I mean, look, I I drank the Kool Aid for sure, and and I went and I saw it uh, six times, and 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 I and I'm not going to take back the fact that I had a great time all six times yeah. in that theater. I had a lot of fun. What? Don't worry, sound, Darth Maul's coming up soon. He's coming up no, soon. No, just I, I was, you know, I was I was into it. Um, and then it's all Star Wars movies. Force Awakens. I think I'm, I'm at five. Mm-hmm. I have to say, it was a Star Wars film. It was The Empire Strikes Back, and uh, I walked to the theater and during the summer. I saw it 13 times. Holy crap balls. Yeah. I awesome. loved that movie. Yeah, man, literally, I loved that film. Good man. All right. Ashley, what's up next? Harry J.A. Killick writes, is that, why is there no hype for the Brothers Grimsby movie? Come on. It's Sasha Baron Cohen. It is Sasha Baron Cohen, and man, that last trailer really reminds you of this guy's storied career in comedy just to sell this movie. So I think there's some publicity for it. I've started to see some ads on TV. Remember, it's a comedy. It's not a big budget, you know, summer blockbustery kind of superhero movie. It's a comedy about a brother finding his other brother and Sasha Baron Cohen and Mark Strong starring it. It looks like it could be funny. The trailers haven't really done it for me, mm-hmm. but you're going to start to see more advertising roll after that. Trailers just hit me like a brick. They, I didn't laugh. I remember like, oh my God, this the idea of it seemed so funny, but then the execution of just the trailers and you know, a comedy when you see a trailer for it and it's like no laughs, you're yeah. like, w- either the movie's incredible, it's a genius film and they're just not able to cut it cut the trailer together so you have to see it in person but that's usually more rare what's usually the case is the it's just not good yeah i agree with you and also the marketing has been kind of desperate um the last trailer just didn't even start with anything in the movie it started with if you like ali g and you like <laughs> borat oh, wow. and it's like but wait a minute they're not even in the movie it's nothing to do with it. and then the other marketing thing that they had was they had uh, Sasha Baron Cohen go on Jimmy Kimmel, but they said it was too crazy to show any of the clips, so they showed the audience watching it. And there's a particular clip, and they all like start reacting to it and, and laughing and going crazy in the background. But it's like, you know, I don't see what they're laughing at. I don't. I, I have no idea. It so probably involves a butthole. Something. So I don't know. I don't know what it was. So the movie. I'm still. I have. I have high hopes for the movie because I do like. Uh, him a lot, and I and I hope that it's so outrageous. I hope that it's going more towards what you're saying, yeah. Schnepp. Is that I like that? Type yeah, of that it's just like they don't know how to cut the movie because it's so crazy. They right. don't know really how to market it, so it hasn't been the best. But I am gonna say it's probably gonna stink. Yeah, unfortunately. Next up, Josh Saylor writes, "What's your favorite band from a movie?" Oh man, I mean, this is so easy for me. Sexual I don't even chocolate. Think about. It. I know you're a big sexual chocolate fan. Tell the kids why you love sexual chocolate so much. It's he's, it's just Randy Watson, man. The guy's great. <laughs> I mean, he just does not care. He drops the mic, takes off. No one's clapping for him. He doesn't care. He drops. He's out of there. <laughs> he's singing the Whitney Houston yeah. song. The best part about that sequence to me, though, in Coming to America, if you haven't caught it in a while, is one of the barbershop guys just loving it. Like that yeah. boy's good. He's good. Yeah, good and terrible. <laughs> uh, is that the question? The best band in a movie? Yeah. yeah. Best yeah. band in a movie. Wedding singer. Yeah. So, that Robbie Hart. You guys are forgetting about the band that not only came together and aligned the planets, they brought peace to the entire universe. That would be wild. Stallion. They wanted Eddie Van Halen yeah. to join their band in the first Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. When that fell through, they just decided to start practicing their instruments a little harder. They got the princesses involved. They got Station involved, I believe, on drums. That band kicked ass. Wild okay. Stallions is the greatest mm-hmm. movie band of all time. Sorry, Spinal Tap. Sorry, Eddie and the Cruisers. We're glad Eddie Wilson is actually alive, but Wild Stallions takes the cake. I'm saying okay. Buckaroo Banzai and his crazy team, of Jeff Goldblum, and his, I can't remember what the rest of the band I was called. I have no idea Buckaroo what you're talking Banzai about. and the Red Flying Eagles, where they had some really okay. crazy names. 
name. What the? Yeah. What in God's Buckaroo, name? I would put Justine Bateman in Satisfaction up against oh, wow. that. Buckaroo Banzai is Peter Weller. Really? Yeah, yeah look We're it up. We're all copying a band with Once Jeff again, Mark, Mark uh, and School his amazing of knowledge of film. Yeah. Max uh, Rebo band? Dude, yeah. we're getting yelled uh, at. What band did we forget? Uh, Stillwater? Stillwater is the band yeah. that we I forgot, thought you were going to say but... Nickelback, but... What, you know. <laughs> God gave rock Ashley, and got roll. any uh, movie bands? I was going to say School of Rock. I love oh, that sorry. movie. Uh, I had I'm you more stolen. of a uh, Josie and the Pussycats gal, oh, okay, and I'm sorry okay. about that. Very prejudiced. <laughs> well, just don't pay right. Jim. <laughs> um, Jonathan Peck writes, any updates or news on the new Martin Scorsese film Silence coming out in 2016. I mean, no updates, except that it's another one I wish I actually would have put in that list. Too late. Too yeah, late. Too late. Um, but Andrew Garfield and Scorsese working together, I mean, it's Scorsese. So yeah. he's one of those guys, man. When when he puts out the movie, you just sit your ass down and you watch it. Is that the one that drop. takes place in Japan? Yeah. Like sexual chocolate. What was that? Are they going to Japan in that movie? Uh, I think so. I mean, like, yeah, Scorsese is one of those guys, you're right, where it doesn't matter what the poster looks like. If yeah. you see the name Scorsese, you're going to want to get involved somehow. So you agree? Yes, totally. Very good. Good short Sound of silence. That round. Yep. Let's do two more queries. Okay. Oh, Gabby Barrios Cruz writes, I'm bored in class. Give me a shout out. Anyways, my question is, do you think that DC may cast someone as Robin? First of all, Gabby, how the hell are you? This is what you should be doing in class. Do not worry about learning. It's all going in one ear and out the other. You can study the night before the test. You do not need to pay attention in class. That's a public service announcement. Now, Ashley, what was the other question? Should Robin be in the DCU? Will they, will they cast Robin? Uh, yeah, you got to... I don't know. I, look, we have to see Batman versus Superman because we got to know maybe they already casted Robin right. and yeah. he got axed by the Joker. That's right. what it appears to look like from those early trailers we saw. So maybe there was already a Robin and he's dead. He's gone. He's done. So a lot like your A in class because you're watching us <laughs> instead of paying attention. They might have done. They might have done flashback stuff with him. Right? Yeah, my guess would be that they already had two Robins. You would go with. Uh, you know, the guy who's now Nightwing, and I'm sure they're going right. to throw that guy in. He's alive. That's Dick Grayson. And then whoever, if it was Jason Todd or whoever they went with when Batman replaced, uh, you know, uh, Grayson and got the second Robin and he was killed by the Joker. And have come back. Maybe. Yeah. Well, the guy is killed. You, know, you see the body. No, I'm saying, Gra but yeah, saying I think, Grayson comes back. I think Grayson yeah. is alive and he's going to yeah. be Nightwing. And maybe in the R-rated Blu-ray, you hear Ben Affleck say, I miss Dick. All right, Ashley, what is the last <laughs> question of the day? All right, Gary Richardson writes, with Hugh Jackman hanging up his claws, who do you think can take his place as Wolverine, if anyone? Sam Worthington, maybe? Mm. <laughs> Jai Courtney? Um, mm. Ah, that's tough. Look, my first thought would be Russell Crowe, but he's older than Hugh Jackman. I'm going so Tom seeing Hardy. A different Tom Hardy is not a bad choice. Yeah, I think Tom Hardy. I would like to just have them retire Wolverine for at least like ten years and like go with X twenty three, give give it to a female. I mean a woman the, that's a character. She's yeah. a female wolf, Wolverine. Let that move forward the next ten years and then just reboot the X Men. You guys sure you don't want to see Nick Nolte as Wolverine? You guys are sure yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his Hulk dogs. All right. As long as he comes with those guys. <laughs> yeah, I know it, Professor. Uh, X Men. Here we close out Mark the program Ellis. with Hulk yeah, dogs. I'm bringing out I my want poodles. To thank everybody here on the crew Dick. for putting Where are my such a great poodles? show. Yeah. Probably was a little late, but we ended yeah. on time. Thank you to Ray, to Dennis, to Jonathan, to Wendy in the back, as well as our man Mark and Adam back there. Uh, and I want to thank the boys at the table. Shep. Where can the kids find you? You can find me and my Hulk dogs at Twitter and other places. Just at John Snap. Find my film, The Death of Superman, who lives with the Hulk dogs at TDOSLWH, and check out Kickstarter next week. The bar has been set high. Can you outdo oh, the Nolte? You know what? I'm not done yet. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would I would do it in Schnepp voice. I'm looking at you, Finstock. <laughs> I'm looking at you with your little weird thing that you wear and your guessing games. Me and Dennis. We were on the Schmodown a couple couple months ago. You guys were good. And uh, JT, I'll give him some credit, but this other guy, he just guesses randomly. It's like, <laughs> I don't know how we, we, we have film knowledge. We're like, ah, we got a couple of hard guesses. We didn't really, you know, we lost. I'm not saying we didn't lose. But why we lost is what I got an issue with. And I'm demanding a rematch with Captain uh, Weirdo Beardo. <laughs> Finstock, I'm coming for you, son. It's coming in a couple weeks. Ooh, the Train challenge. up. Oh, There's no the... guessing games. Uh, your little magic games are not going to work, son. It's the over. ultimate schmodown now has a beard mask call out on there. Christian, <laughs> A, do you think Finstock's going to respond to this threat? And B, where can the kitties find you? I, look, as much as Finstock knows nothing, I've never seen him uh, back down from a challenge, so I think we're probably going to get a finstock schnep matchup here pretty soon. Um, for me, you can find me, Christian Harloff, both Instagram, 
and Facebook, Twitter, the whole thing. The other thing I wanted to tell you guys, as far as mailbag goes, please submit your questions at Collider, excuse me, Collider Video at gmail.com. And people ask, how about how do we get certain questions? Don't just ask Batman, Superman, and Star Wars questions. Let's go at broad, as many questions as you can about film in general, behind the scenes stuff, anything you want. Make sure you submit your questions. The other thing to let people know is that people have been asking about The Walking Dead show. It is coming back after the Oscars. We're just finding, finding the time. The recap show will be back after the Oscars. We will send out a tweet and let everybody know. There'll be some announcements about it. So just let everybody know that that's happening. And then Jedi Council, Thursdays. Big exciting news happening. Ashley, how about you? You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram <laughs> at Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. You guys can find me on all the social media networks at Mark Ellis Live. And this weekend, I will be at the Las Vegas of the East Coast, Delaware, performing. <laughs> and I'm going to tweet out the links to get that and my show in Pennsylvania on Saturday night. You can subscribe to Christian and I's YouTube channel, Schmoes No. Head on over there right now. Hey, guys, make sure you check out our friends at AMC Theaters. Go to amctheaters.com and get all your links and showtime information for upcoming movies like Eddie the Eagle. And make sure you guys right now on your computers go to Collider.com and bookmark that page for all the latest breaking news. And, of course, subscribe to us here, Collider Video, on YouTube. Thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.